From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague, Noel, is on an adventure, but will be returning shortly. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Dylan the Tennessee Pal Fagan. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. There is a civil war happening right now as we record this evening. In the United States? Well, not yet as we record, but depending on when you listen to this episode or possible series of episodes, uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, There's a there's a fascinating case uh, and a heartbreaking case of civil war that's been going on since 2020 or so uh, out in Myanmar. Oh, yes. Formerly Burma. Mm -hmm. If you even if you check it out on Google Maps, it says Myanmar and then like (laughs) Burma also. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, we learned about this a little while back. I think it was sometime in August of this year. We learned about it from a listener who called themselves Surf Rider, and we mm-hmm. still are unsure if it's W-R-I-T-E-R or R-I-D-E-R. Mm-hmm. But either way, Surf Rider, thank you again. We said we would follow up uh, with an episode on this. And Matt, could you tell us a little bit more about what uh, Surf Rider or Writer was talking about? Surfrider was specifically talking about criminal organizations that were functioning on the border of Myanmar, like basically all the way, mm. all around the border of yeah. Myanmar, but specifically around one river, I think you say Moai, Moe River, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, M-O-E-I, mm-hmm. and it's basically apartment complexes, eat, love, pray, places where it's it's self-contained mm. basically if you live in one of these places you just stay there and out of these places there's a lot of organized crime and uh human trafficking where people are mm. basically shipped in to f- to function there as cogs in a big old uh, i guess scam chain scam slave farms mm-hmm. yeah and we've explored uh you know myanmar is familiar to a lot of people, aka Burma, but there's a, a, a lot more that escapes the attention of the West. It's a story of crime, conspiracy, and chaos, all spiraling out of control uh, along the border of Myanmar. And much of the rest of the world seems to willfully ignore the growing chaos. The world collectively looked at the problem, just like someone who sees a vagrant asking for change at a traffic light. They made a passing glance at Myanmar and they said, I have other stuff to do. Well, guess what, folks? We don't. That's our (laughs) cold open. (laughs) (laughs) Our Friday is fully open. Here we go. Here are the facts. Okay, so it's interesting. We've been arguably, Matt, going through kind of a phase in exploring mysteries and conspiracies in this region of the world in Southeast Asia. It wasn't too long ago uh, that we talked about the plane of jars. And uh, thank you to our conspiracy realist who wrote in to correct us and say, actually, these don't look like cauldrons or jars. These look like crocs. C-R-O-C-K-S. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I saw some pictures. There were, you wrote a fantastic letter. Matter of fact, <laughs> let's pull up the name. You wrote such a fantastic letter to us. <laughs> Held off on answering it because... We are saying crock pots, like the thing my mom used to make pot roast in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well... Wait. Are we saying that? Just crocks? I don't know. Is that a brand name? <laughs> I'm unsure. Ooh, like that time we got in trouble for saying Frisbee instead yeah. of... I just know <laughs> you, you plug them in, they're electric, and they make potatoes real nice and good. I love it. I love... I, I have an emotional... You have. You know how I like, I like three emotions a year or something? One mm-hmm. of those is affection for my crock pot. Yeah. Which is, sorry, Grandma. Just cook it low <laughs> and slow, baby. Uh, that is Caddy Wampus, by the way. 
What is Caddy Wampus? Caddy Wampus is the person who wrote to oh. us about the difference between cauldrons, jars, and crocs. To which we say, Caddy, that's a croc. Yeah, that's a croc of Caddy Wampus vases. Yes, there we go. They're vases. So the plane of jars in Laos, the mystery has not been solved. Myanmar, though, if you've looked at the map from our previous exploration of Laos, you'll see that Myanmar parentheses, Burma, is just to the west of Laos. Yeah. And it borders a ton of countries. Yes. The, the border that it shares with Laos is fairly small mm -hmm. compared to, like, Thailand, which is right uh, south the of The whole that, peninsula basically right? split in half. Exactly. But then you've also got China, uh, what, Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. And aren't there is, – is there more? Is it just mostly – India. Ch India too? <laughs> Gosh. Mm -hmm. So they are – they – well, that's why that's why this episode is so complicated and interesting and potentially impactful because that the land that makes up Myanmar potentially has influence on so many other countries. A hundred percent and well said. You know, some conspiracy realist of a certain age uh, may recall when this country changed its name because it didn't change its name to Myanmar until 1989. Wow. Yeah, most famously when uh, Marvel Comics published a new edition of uh, their their encyclopedia. Oh, wow. I remember it. That's the other thing that happened. Those are the two <laughs> things that know. happened. I didn't know. <laughs> but yeah, I remember when I was six years old and looked up at the old TV and they said, Burma is now Myanmar, and I was like, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. And they might be giants later, uh, really missed the ball on that one, mm -hmm. didn't they? Mm -hmm. Too much focus on Turkey. But okay, names aside, people have been living in this area since far before we started calling it what we call it today. The first human settlers appeared on the central plain because there are plains and there are hills. Mm -hmm. And the people are often called like the plains people or the hill people. The first humans were there 11,000 years ago, and I love what you brought up there, Matt, about it's the luck of the draw in the in the geography here. It's been a nexus point for all kinds of exchanges. I mean, it's sandwiched in between these two homes to ancient civilizations, India and China. They're always trying to spend, uh, like, send stuff to each other. Yes. Sometimes send wars to each other. Sometimes yeah. and expand their borders. Mm -hmm. But often they're attempting to trade because in order to fight wars in other parts of the world, you have to have a significant amount of money coming in, usually via trade. Yeah. I, I want to just quickly talk about that 11,000 years number mm -hmm. because like we talked about on the show numerous times, that is the best evidence we have right now of human beings living in that area, right? Right. So, and we are discovering year over year mm -hmm. that human beings have been around doing stuff for way longer than we even th think or expected. It changes every year, mm -hmm. just like the nomination for world's oldest person. That's yeah. the world record with the most turnover. I think that's a really good point, Matt, because when we say – whenever we say evidence indicates humans were in so-and-so or doing so-and-so by X amount of time, it means that's when we found physical evidence. Yes. And the world is hungry, especially this part of the world. It eats the creations of man, including human remains. It's so hungry. So, so famished. Uh, tune into our later episode, by the way, on the future of poop. <laughs> just always be closing <laughs> always be closing you know it is the it's the type of side hustle i never expected but it is like a gift once you realize that you can sell your own poop if you're diligent enough yes or diligent <laughs> enough. enough oh gosh I bet he could sell his poop <laughs> right now like today i would yeah I, I i think we're gonna leave this in i would <laughs> I, I'm not saying 100% sold, but uh, I would love to read some literature and hear the pitch. Oh, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, just a quick shout out to Dylan. We could leave this part in. Dylan is the guy who taught me that you can eat Cheetos with chopsticks. What? To keep your fingers clean. That seems like a lot of work, but also kind of fun. So everybody's got a weird side hustle. 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's our segue, and uh, and we're going to talk about some dangerous side hustles for now. What you need to know is, uh, once upon a time, this place that we call Myanmar today, it had a massive reputation for surrounding countries. Records from China show that from the first century BCE to the ninth century Common Era, uh, there was something called the Pew government, PYU. And we're not uh, we're not native speakers, so pardon our pronunciation. This government, they didn't have prisons. They didn't have slaves. They had, quote, no fetters or chains. And for the rare criminals who got in trouble with this benevolent government, the only punishment was, quote, a few strokes of a whip, which surely still hurt like yeah. the dickens. But. Well, I mean, uh, strokes of a whip, that would, that's like tearing flesh, right? For sure. And, and it's way, in my mind, it's way worse than maybe some of at least the rumors and then actual policies in Singapore of the caning that we heard about a long time ago. Yeah. Which yeah, is a different thing. Too. But caning's very damaging. Yes. Not good. Not good. But not the same as the velocity that a whip attains when it. Not the same laceration potential. Uh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And also it depends where you hit people. Uh, like the old maritime punishment or torture and was also used on enslaved people is bastinado. When they you, would put you in like a box of scorpions? No, 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 no. Oh, that, that's, that's just hook? Okay. <laughs> I think that's just hook. Okay. Uh, but it is a, a great idea. Uh, very fear factor. No, that's where they beat the bottom of the feet. Oh, yeah. Because it hurts a lot and it prevents you from... It lowers your mobility. Yeah. It's <sighs> evilly well thought out. And we're going to see some of that. Anyway, what we need to know is despite Myanmar's modern day reputation, earned or unearned, uh, it had a much longer reputation in the past being a very peaceful place. It was pretty extraordinary both back then and in the modern day, but it's no longer the, the case because Matt, like we said, with a nexus point, where you can be a facilitator of cultural exchange, you also have a lot of people hungry for your real estate. Oh, for sure. And you essentially cross a river and then you're in Myanmar from any, you know, any direction, unless you're coming in from the Bay of Bengal. Uh, yeah, you're just, you're strolling through the place and empires surely did. Some of them just came through you know, like rolled through and sure. caused some damage and some chaos. Others yeah. stuck around. Like I believe it was it was Japan that stuck around for quite a while mm -hmm. uh, and, and officially occupied the place. But you also had <laughs> companies that yes. were de facto countries like the British, what was it? The British East India Company? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah not great. Uh, who else is in there? Oh, Mongol, the Mongolian invasions that yeah. occurred and not just one. Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of conflict that's been going on there for a long time. It's another one of those places where I've never had Myanmar specific cuisine or like Burmese oh, yeah, cuisine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I imagine it's another one of those places in the world where there's so many different influences from all of the mm -hmm. the strife, but also people who get displaced there and then stay there. Right. I would love to see whatever whatever the um cuisine I don't know what you would call it, but whatever the Myanmar cuisine is, I want to try it. They usually call it Burmese cuisine. Yeah. I've, I don't, our best bet for you and Dylan and myself would be to go to Buford Highway and just yes. roll the dice, which I love doing. Just ask around. <laughs> just ask around, be cool. But I have tried it in other parts of the world and you nailed it because it's a, it's almost like Peruvian cuisine in that there are so many other influences. Cool. That they're great curries. I know you love a curry. Yeah. And so, uh, and I also know that every time we talk about a far-flung country, we have to talk about the food. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to just no, bring no. it up out of nowhere. It's, just, <laughs> no, it's important, man. And also, I, I think maybe both of us skipped breakfast. <laughs> but, I know. But we we know for sure that the British East India Company famously asks. Mm -hmm. well, just walk out the street for that one. Uh, but we also know that, to your point, Matt, after a mid-Japanese occupation, the country we now call Myanmar declared its independence in 1947 with the Burma Independence Act of 1947. Not the most creative name, but an awesome idea. We're all about independence problem is when a country moves out of occupation or colonialism and becomes independent, it is also 
at one of the most vulnerable periods in its history. The time after immediate independence is very, very dicey. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Well, it, it's, it's such a difficult thing to do. You're trying to establish what the government looks like and how it functions, right, in this independent nation. You also need a strong enough military to defend that nation and or gain independence from whoever, you know, is occupying your nation that you want to build. But then you got to be really careful with that military, make sure it's not too powerful and it doesn't want to just take the reins and decide what happens or doesn't happen in your new country. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that is the... Oh, you nailed it. That is one of the trickiest parts, uh, especially of any kind of representative democracy, any kind of, you know, even constitutional monarchy where there is some kind of voice for the people. It has to exist in conjunction with the military. And that's why so many constitutions separate what mm -hmm. the military can and cannot do with civilians. Uh, and that's also why militaries have such a reputation for being compromised, especially in post-colonial countries. Cough, cough, Wagner, cough, cough, Africa, cough, cough. Everywhere right now. <laughs> side gigs we were talking Dude. about. You know what I mean? Uh, Some people sell poop. Other people sell nations. Hi. I specialize in private special operations. I mean parties. I mean uh, gigs. <laughs> I'm a tourist. I'm a consultant. I would love to have a conversation uh, with the colonel. Yeah. It's cool. It's cool. We it's just totally cool. We're just going to go on the roof mm -hmm. or in the basement. With this suitcase. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everything's cool. But it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a messed up thing that everybody has to do because in the end it's ideas and, and when you're forming a new government, especially, you know, in revolt of some existing thing, right? you got to make sure everybody's on the same page and how in the heck do you get everybody on the same page? It's not possible. Some people are going to think differently than whoever the, the founders are. Right. And, um, if they've got weapons and know-how, then you could be in trouble. And often the uh, so-called agents of revolution just want to have the same terrible operation, the same horrific machine, but they want to be the one at the lever, which makes it yeah. now good. Yeah. You know there sure I mean? is. a. There are a lot of goods going through this specific port on this specific mm -hmm. border. It should sure would be nice if I was the one, you know, mm -hmm. taking the bribes every time the illegal goods went across. Yeah. That's what people... In the world of nation states, that's often what people mean when they say they solved a problem. They mean now they are <laughs> profiting from the earlier problem because mm -hmm. that's the that's what they were solving for. Anyway, so what we're saying is it makes sense, unfortunately, that like so many other countries in the region, uh, modern day Myanmar has been beset with its own struggles. Inner turmoil, foreign intervention continues, government upheavals, violence. Uh, it's continuing unrest and conflict to this day. And, and that's because just like less than two decades after independence, it's 1967 and uh, the military does a coup d'etat. Yeah. They just come in. Perhaps it was their idea. But maybe. They, maybe. But Maybe. again, we there's so much potential oh, influence. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much potential influence. And we do we do have to say, I mentioned it earlier, specifically influence from India and China because they yeah. are the two most populous country, countries in the world mm -hmm. and they're also two of the most powerful. Uh in India is definitely I mean it's up there. Mm -hmm. Um I don't I don't know if you can say no, the number four most powerful or whatever, but but yeah. India has a lot of strength, a lot of military mar sure. might, and a lot of technology. China has the same, so it you can imagine even back in '67 that influence there is possible, incredibly strong. And let's not forget that there is still at that point 
There are still post-colonial forces from the game that are involved. There are still, you know, like, shout out to Rudyard Kipling's Kim. You know, the Brits are still there in some capacity. And, of course, 67, you've got French Indochina. You've got the U.S. definitely not being there. Yeah, the U.S. was not a part of any of that. Uh Uh-uh. No. (laughs) No. Nor was the Soviet Union in any way. Shame on you for these unfounded allegations. But yeah, for one reason or another, there's this military coup d'etat. We're not oversimpl... We don't want to oversimplify. A lot led to it. We do clearly suspect foreign intervention of some sort. The military dictatorship ends up ruling more or less the same up to now, up to 2024 as we record this. Spoiler, they're super duper weird. (laughs) I'm just an observation. They're very into astrology. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's Burmese astrology. It's the reason they moved the capital. That's amazing. I I have not encountered that in in any of the research today. (laughs) I'm going to look into that after this, and we all should because that is fascinating. That's a whole episode. I want to know. Yeah, we we should totally do that. And before we, uh, what do you call it? Before we seem as though we are casting aspersion here, let's also keep in mind that former U.S. presidents have had court astrologers. Oh, yeah. Which is basically a magician. Gosh, that's exciting. At that point. And we're not saying there's anything wrong with astrology, Western or other derivations. Yeah. You know, if I ever become president, I'm going to have like a court Duncan Trussell who is just there to be like, (laughs) We got to think about this, man. You know, be like, oh, Duncan, you're right. I'm going to just have a straight up court magician. Oh, okay. No, wait, we'll have a court magician, like a Copperfield. Is this your card kind of guy? And then we'll have a court sorcerer. Whoa. And it'll have to be the weirdest person we could find. I'm going to get, I'm going to get officially a new position in the West Wing called the West Wing Warlock. And I love it. And he, he just haunts the place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Wesley, West Wing Warlock. Uh, let's hope his name's Wesley. We just call him W. <laughs> Didn't some guy already get that nickname? I think so. Well, we'll cast him then if he's already got the nickname. <gasps> he's just, he's just <laughs> he's in back. his, oh, he's in his sanctum in the West Wing he's just back. painting. Just painting weirdly intimate pictures of himself. Oh, I love it. In the tub. That's that's the real magic. It's the paintings we made along the way. Oh, wow. I don't know how we got here, and it's my fault, and <laughs> here we go. No, no, we're going to magic it back because, look, as crazy, and I, I kind of derailed us on that, as crazy as it sounds, yes, the leadership of Myanmar is what we call a military junta. There mm-hmm. aren't really elections. Every time there is an election and the people have spoken or, you know, the upper middle class or whatever has spoken, then boom, 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 there's another coup, a coup, 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 right? And this happens again and again. They crush opposition in the case of the 2020 general election. Uh, it didn't go their way. They appointed Anyang San Suu Kyi, who is a world famous activist. And uh, when the election didn't go their way, the military, known as the Tatma Daw, uh, staged another coup. And part of the turmoil we're in now, this civil war that begins in the wake of this other coup, is because of the point we raised earlier. There's a lot of ethnic diversity. This is not... This is not near as uh, homogenous a place as, say, Norway or Japan. No, no. Yeah, it's weird to talk about this. But 56% are Burmese, which is yeah. like, I I was born here. I grew up here. I know everything here. I speak the language. I am a, I am Burmese. Similar to core. like Han Chinese. Exactly. Uh, but then the rest, I mean, the rest is just split up between all of these different cultures that have gone through the area. The Karen... The San. The Karen's a big deal. The Karen is a huge deal. And it's, we're not being silly about that. We're being kind of silly. (laughs) But that's a real, that's a real thing. It is a real thing. A bunch of the issues that have been happening recently are about the Karen. Yes, 100%. There's also a conflict between other groups, the Shan, the Lao, and the Karen. There are multiple, 
moves for secession, for autonomy, multiple contradictory religious or ideological goals. It's it's a huge stew, right? Just even unto the language. The official language is Burmese, but there are tons of indigenous languages, and they're mutually unintelligible in some cases. Diversity is always a huge benefit to a country over time, but mismanaged internal conflicts in in diversity can lead to chaos, which is why Myanmar has been in that civil war. Uh, Even the civil war is messy. All right, you got the military on one side. Okay, that's easy. They're not the official government, but they do run everything. And then you've got the national unity government. Wait a second. NUG, yes. They're the government in exile. Okay. So they don't run the thing, but when the UN has their little parties, these are the folks who show up. That is so funny. I'm sorry, I should say sessions. (laughs) (laughs) i don't think the u.n is hitting people up on the group chat yeah got a party uh be there promptly at 8 15 Mm -hmm. hit them with an lmao to take the sting off right yeah i'm learning how to text but (laughs) that is interesting though that there's a there's an official recognized government that runs the show as far as the rest of the world is concerned yeah but then in all actuality it's essentially the military slash official, other official government. Not the unity government, the other one. Yeah, it's kind of like in Somalia, right? Mm. Because warlords run huge regions of the area, but there is a government in exile, largely in exile. This is an unfortunate thing that happens, but those aren't the only two sides of the civil war. There is also a panoply of uh, rebel groups, right, often with indigenous roots uh, to a particular ethnicity or peoples. And that's they, like the Karen group we're right, talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> I, you were still going up. You <laughs> please continue. I, I was, no, just, no. was just interjecting so that in the way my mind made that connection, I wanted other people to make that. Yes. The Karen. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Karen while we're here. Uh, oh, sorry. Is it in here? Cause I don't know if I can tell you fully about it. Uh, I <laughs> well, read some about it though. We know it's spelled like the name Karen. K-A-R-E-N, yes. Has nothing to do with the memes, except in our heads and in our hearts. That is correct. Uh, Here we go. This is, I'm going to read from a story here from Mm. Irrawaddy from February 28th, 2023. So a while ago. Yeah. And this goes back to the original stuff we were looking at when we went to Myanmar in that listener mail episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But this was about... Karen National Union, or the KNU, and specifically it was about their involvement in a, quote, Chinese project in Mirawadi. Uh, This is one particular city that, where it's like a border city Mm -hmm. uh, that we've talked about there that connects to Thailand. And it's all about that place, KK Park, Mm -hmm. which was one of those suburban hubs where all that crime was happening. Sure. Um, but I don't know that I can fully tell you about this Karen National Union or the military, mm-hmm. the militaries that they control. Yeah. And that, that can be tough because the situation is somewhat fluid, to be quite honest. But the, the Karen are what are called Tibeto Burmo people okay. or Burman people. So I have roots in uh, in Burma and in Tibet, and they're they're an ethno linguistic group who are about they're pretty small. They're about six point six nine nice percent of the population. A lot of people from this group have moved into Thailand. Got it through the notoriously porous Thai Burmese or Myanmar border. Anyway, so there's this crazy complicated civil war. It's uh, absolutely terrible. For the civilians, we've got one official government that is in exile. We've got uh, a military junta. We've got a ton of other folks in between, secessionist groups, guerrilla fighters. And then, of course, some just pretty heinous, straight-up criminals. Oh, yeah. Who are just there the way that vultures go to a charnel pit. Yes. And and from various countries that are just illegally in the country and just doing their thing because for some reason they feel like they can get away with it and perhaps they can get away with it uh, maybe a little more easily than they could if they were on their home turf. Yeah, as of March 2023, the United Nations estimated uh, that post-February 2021 coup, 
17.6 million people in Myanmar required humanitarian assistance. 1.6 million were internally displaced, run out of their, their homes and their towns, and over 55 thousand civilian buildings had been destroyed. Now, how many refugees are there in other adjacent countries? We simply do not know. You know, there there was a bit of a program within the U.S. to bring in Myanmar yes. refugees, which is, uh, at least from what I'm reading, is looking to be shut down by the current administration or the incoming administration. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And if you want to visit Myanmar, Bad news, all travelers are warned to stay away. Yeah. Uh, even if you are a refugee or if you've relocated and you're part of the diaspora, uh, your nation state is probably going to warn you not to go there, especially the major cities, the new capital, the clashes between the government in exile and the junta and all these other opportunistic forces mean that multiple groups consider themselves the rule of law in the country, the yeah. state power. And all the, uh, the only real operative definition of state is the monopoly over violence. So yeah. multiple actors feel they have a monopoly over violence. You step out of line one time in, one, in the wrong person's opinion, you are in jail and no one's going to help you. Nowhere is the chaos more visible than along those borders, Bangladesh, India, China, Laos, Thailand. Uh, it seems to be trouble at every single international line. So what is happening and why? We'll get into it right after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. All right. Before we dive into even deeper conspiracies here, Matt, I, I propose we take a look at the border country by country. Ooh, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, spoiler. It's not a super pleasant story, folks. If we start with Bangladesh, um, uh, which is also the title of a great song by our friend Heems and your old Droog. But if we if we start with Bangladesh, let's go to The Diplomat. They have a great article about this mm -hmm. where they point out that Bangladesh is having problems with the border guard police on the Myanmar side illegally crossing the border and getting in fights with the border guards from Bangladesh. The Myanmar forces, because there's no single authority who decides what is or isn't legal, they're very difficult to negotiate with. So Bangladesh is facing continual incursions, mortar attacks, gunships are coming in, and then they go back to uh, who they thought was the authority, Myanmar, and then they just keep passing the buck. Oh, that's a different warlord. Oh, you're looking for the, you know, the Karens or whatever. Yeah, it's such a weird situation. Just to just to have a whole like in this case like a hundred people coming yeah. across a border from Myanmar saying hey uh, it's not good over there help and then they're like uh, y'all can't really trust you here but then also there's mortars coming from the Myanmar side right and <laughs> you're just like well also yeah there's we have to keep in mind those the border guards from Myanmar who are incurring into Bangladeshi territory. They're often chasing and attempting to kill ethnic minorities from Myanmar, the Rohingya in yes. particular. Who are perhaps escaping yes. situations on that side of the border. Straight up refugees. These are not tourists. These are not mercs. These are not consultants. These are innocent people who are running for their lives. Quite literally, the government of Myanmar or the ruling junta has expelled the ethnic Rohingya into Bangladeshi territory actively since 1978. And just since uh, August of 2017, there have been more than 1.3 million Rohingya refugees stuck in Bangladesh. They have nowhere to go. It's not just that they feel unsafe back home. It's that even when they try, their home government won't let them in. Yeah. And will attack them. Yeah. And Bangladesh itself as a country has had so many problems uh, over yeah. the last like, uh, 20 years that I've been paying attention at least. Mm -hmm. And I've known several, several people from that country who, you know, 
openly talk about the issues of the country they love and wish they could go back even to Bangladesh, but they just can't. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, so it just makes me really sad, mm-hmm. uh, especially for all these people who are displaced. And, and it is, ah, it makes me thankful and hopeful for countries that do have robust programs to bring in refugees. Yes. But I think it's weird because you also have to be aware that those, those kinds of programs do have major issues. Sure. Wow. That's so, it's so interesting just how complex any one little issue Mm -hmm. is that we're dealing with here in Myanmar. Yeah. We'll also think, you know, things like the, the flaws inherent in lottery systems Mm. for, Hey, you're a refugee. May the odds be in your favor. That is fucked up. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, so this is, and thank you for the beep there, Dylan. We feel strongly about this because the rest of the world did, has done very little to stop the ongoing violence at this specific border in Bangladesh, but also in Myanmar and the region throughout the United Nations, the rest of the planet seem distracted by other disasters. You know, Ukraine, climate change driven, natural disasters, the growing instability inside Myanmar. And along that border in particular, I don't know. Here's the thing. When you ignore a problem, the yeah, the problem remains unsolved, but the problem also gathers momentum. You pay interest on the things that you ignore, right? And the interest is adding up to the principle here, which is that depending on how things play out, the collapse of Myanmar could destabilize the whole region. All of South Asia, all of Southeast Asia, getting nasty really, really quickly. And that's something that the government of China, the big dog in the area, is very concerned about. And it's probably why they support the military. Also because I think they control the military. You think China does? I think think they heavily influence the military. Again, astrology controls the military, but I think Ah, China ah, has ah. a lot of influence on it. Got it, yeah. Astrology controls all of it and everyone everywhere, right? At least if you believe believe that. Uncle G, what's your sign? It's in the stars. (laughs) Um, But but I see what you're saying. And that is, when we say the government there, we're talking about the junta, the the government that took over. Right, not the democratic government in exile. The unity that is at the UN. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about those guys. We're talking, like you said, about the military. And for some time now, China has been concerned about the stability of its neighbor to the south. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah. Myanmar's a buffer state with India because, you know, China and India, real frenemies. And uh, they also, they need that buffer state, but China also has the most control over Myanmar now. And even though it's a vassal state, Being a vassal state doesn't prevent it from bucking against Beijing. They kind of – they will go their own way if they feel motivated or if the stars are right. And just for people who are unaware of vassal state, that – it's not saying that China has complete control over them, but they do function for a lot of the needs of Mm -hmm. a controlling country, in this case China. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point, Matt. Economically dependent upon China for trade, for instance – financially dependent, therefore, in many ways. So in 2023, just last year as we record, China called for a ceasefire in Myanmar uh, because a group of ethnic fighters, sort of guerrilla fighters, uh, captured several border crossings between Myanmar and China. And so China, like a – this is a terrible comparison, but China, like a parent at a sleepover – walked to the door, yelled down into the the stairs, into the den, and said, you kids pipe down, you know? Yeah. And while China was saying, okay, let's have a ceasefire, and then you guys stop firing at each other, they also kept firing. They conducted live fire drills on the side of the frontier, and they did the classic move that, folks, you would do too if you were them. said, just practicing. Oh, Yeah. We're just practicing. With drills and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a drill, guys. We're just testing out new tech or old tech, making sure it still works. Mm-hmm. Just we're doing it 
<laughs> right, right <outside>. here. <laughs> right outside. It's like <laughs> yelling down into the basement and then just starting to fire weapons into the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, right. There's nobody there. And there's yeah. nothing up there, but you can definitely hear the gunshots. <laughs> While continually yelling, calm down, down the <laughs> stairs. Everybody calm down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The explosions will continue until you guys mellow out uh, is kind of what they did. Uh, And you can see this quoted in state-run Chinese media. And also, yeah, we get it. Any member, uh, former or current of a military force knows that you do have to continually train Mm -hmm. because otherwise, when you're in a real situation, you will have no idea what to do. Exactly. And this is something I've never thought about, Ben. Mm -hmm. Just – Thinking about the arms that an infantry would have. Mm -hmm. If you leave those arms somewhere in a barracks, just sitting around for, I mean, even months. Oh, yeah. Those things aren't going to work right when it's time to take them out and use them. So just like this thought of not only keeping the troops Mm -hmm. well oiled. Yeah. uh, But also. (laughs) But also. Lube them up, man. (laughs) Keep them lubed. But that's what you have. You literally have to do that with firearms. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you do. You have to You have to uh, break down and clean the machine. The maintenance cost is a cost in material. It's a cost in time. And it's also a cost in human resources, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the reasons the U.S. military is so dangerous is not just because of all the cutting edge evil toys, but it's also because you have battle-hardened leadership, you have experienced troops and officers. And a lot of militaries don't really have that, nowhere near on that level. You know, it's a thing we don't often talk about, but it is true. Anyway. Them oiled soldiers. <laughs> mm-hmm, lube them up. Uh, so Dylan is loving this. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's the sign of approval. All right. <laughs> Uh, So (laughs) as of this summer, 2024, China's military is yet again just practicing along the border, just doing some drills. You know what I mean? Pay no attention to all these troops in the Yunnan province in southwestern China. They're playing outside. Exactly. I cannot get the image of the guys from Predator, like, out of my head. Just all in the jungle. So sweaty. No shirts. So <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, like what I, is it? What's going on? <laughs> what do you see? <laughs> it's. I love the scene too, where uh, spoilers, by the way, for Predator, where in uh, former Governor Schwarzenegger decides that he has to, you know, the mud. Put yeah. the mud on the chest. Yes. Uh, hide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. You got to get cold. You can't let them see that the hot, hot, oiled chest. <laughs> and it's not like this alien can't switch to ultraviolet, whatever. But also it reminded me of Bugs Bunny. Uh, watching old Bugs Bunny cartoons back in the day, I realized, and this is a non-judgmental statement. This is an observation. I realized that a lot of his plans and schemes unnecessarily involved him putting on makeup and a dress. Interesting. Like he really went out of his way for that part of the scheme. Huh. You know what I mean? And so, Arnold, our question for you, with all due respect, did you really have to smear mud on yourself? And, you know. I think he get did. Get semi-nude? I think he did. Yeah, but why? If you felt like he had to do it, I think he would have done it without the alien. You think so? I think the jungle just gets to you, man. I get it. I get it. And those were some huge weapons they had out there. And that probably gets hot uh, firing off. You know, just think about all the rounds. Uh It's not, it's, it's warm when you're firing an automatic weapon. Yes. Yeah. It's also, also the point about the jungle, uh, is is quite salient because we know that it Earth's biomes can absolutely like eat entire cities. It's happened I, before. I love that you're trying to bring this back. It, I don't think I'm trying. <laughs> no, 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 we just no, we just <laughs> went so far. Off. <laughs> but the jungle is the jungle is a character in the story. Oh yeah, for because sure. It's part of why the borders are so difficult to control yes. outside of concentrated yes. crossings. It's kind of like the parts of this area are like the Darien Gap, which we're going to do another episode on. But the government also of China, even though they say, okay, we're just playing outside, we're just practicing, 
they also make no secret that they're actively spinning up. And if any belligerent Burmese forces make it over the border, they're ready to tango. Yeah. But China's also thinking about the money too, right? Ooh, they're, yeah. they're, they've been working pretty hard. Hard for the money. Yes. A lot of the tensions are occurring right along the border, as we said, right at the top of this, because people are still trying to trade in and out of Myanmar, uh, again, to make money. And Myanmar's GDP is so reliant on moving goods out of Myanmar into other places. Sure. It's official GDP, but also yes. it's actual GDP, which are two very different numbers. Very, very true, because there is a robust under-the-table gross domestic product. Uh, what do we call that? Yeah. Gross domestic residue? Um, gross disreputable product? Hey. Uh, something like that. Like China is – so they're supporting the junta and they tried to get they, – they tried to do carrot and stick diplomacy, which sometimes works. Uh, they told the junta, OK, you know, finger wag. You guys stop killing people. I don't care what the astrologer says. You got to stop killing at least these specific people or we're going to cut your trade routes and you kind of need the money. They did that. It didn't work. The collapse continued. The instability spiraled. And so China has uh, reopened some trade routes recently. But you can still cut the tension with a knife, just like in India. India gave China the cold shoulder. Uh, they had previously – all right, so like in part of the Indian-Myanmar border that you really want to focus on, you'll see something that happens a lot in different parts of the world. It is an ancient village. And then somebody in the days of the ancient empires and the days of colonialism just drew a line and said, this is where one country ends. This is where another one begins. And it's like an interstate rolling straight through your town. So the people who have lived there ever since, technically, you know, some of them are in Myanmar. Technically, some are in India. Mm -hmm. But it's a rural area. They've been living that way forever. They don't care. It does not af really affect them in their day-to-day, -day, you know? Yep. Kind of like when people live in the upper part of the United States and they're right on the border with Canada. Yes. Yes. No, like, it's exactly like that. Like, oh, I, I live in the U.S. or Canada, but I work in the other country. You know, yeah, I guess I go through customs, but that's just Robert. I see him every morning. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ooh. Hold the phone. Mm -hmm. I am? Yeah, this is going to be a two-part episode and literally hold the phone because here in the middle of our series on the troubled border of Myanmar, uh, we're going to pause. We'll be back later this week. In the meantime, we want to hear from you, fellow conspiracy realist. Oh, yes, yes. We are not done with this story at all. Mm -hmm. But hey, maybe you've got some thoughts that have been conjured since we began talking about this. Why don't you find us on social media? We are Conspiracy Stuff oh. on Facebook and YouTube, mm -hmm. which definitely go to YouTube. Check that out. And there's another thing. There's a third thing. X. And we are Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram mm -hmm. and TikTok. Mm -hmm. And guys, if... You want to contact us with your mouth parts, why not give us a call? Yes, literally hold the phone as we said. The number to dial is the following, 1-833-STDWYTK. You'll call in, you'll hear a beep like so, beep, and then you've got three minutes. Go nuts. Tell us what's on your mind. Uh, not to not to blow too much smoke, but we've never said no to a compliment like Mark Twain. Uh, we can live off a good one for like three months. Uh, there are just a few things we'd ask you to do when you call. Give yourself a cool nickname so we can put it in the system and know when you call in every time. It's not to track you, it's just to know, hey, this is the same person with this thought. And then we're building a story together. It's amazing. Uh, do let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in a three-minute voicemail, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are the entities that read every piece of correspondence we receive. Be well aware, yet unafraid. Sometimes the void writes back. Give us the links. Give us the pictures. Take us to the edge of the rabbit hole. Be like humorous Harry. Send us some jokes. No, <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> Send us some jokes that are of a different caliber. Uh, here's one. Uh, why can't you tell kleptomaniacs metaphors? Why? Because they take literally. 
conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.